Hello and welcome to What's My Tagline. I'm your host, Carol Flagg. Thanks for tuning in today. On this show, we put our microphone in front of a variety of industry experts to understand the factors influencing messaging, branding, and reputation in healthcare. You can follow the conversation on Twitter at hashtag What's My Tagline and follow me at Carol Flagg. My guest today is Scott Collins, president of Aria Marketing, an award-winning integrated healthcare communications agency. And our topic for this episode is thought leadership. What is it? How do you get it? And what do you do with it once you have it? Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Hi, Carol. Me too. I'm so excited to be talking to you. It's always fun to chat with you. Yeah, we're we're old friends like most of my guests. We've known each other for quite a while in the in the health IT PR and marketing space. So so always good to chat with somebody that I actually know personally. Uh, and speaking of personally, um, I, I gave you a sort of fair warning. My first question of all my guests is always, if you had to describe yourself as a tagline, what would it be? Well, you know, Aria, uh, my company has a tagline, and I think it kind of applies to me too, which is healthcare communicated. I like it because. Communicating healthcare, as all your listeners know, is hard to do. It's complicated. It's got a lot, a lot of moving pieces, hard for people to pick up on. And those of us that have spent some time figuring out how to get the key ideas across and make it accessible to people that aren't immersed in it, you know, have, have learned an important skill. And we uh, know how to communicate it. I think that's my special skill as a, as a marketing person, being able to communicate healthcare. So I like healthcare communicated for the company and for me. Oh, that, that, that's great. And, and it sounds like I, I know you, like I said, personally, and that, that is a, a great fit. You are, you are an excellent communicator. So before we dive into our meat of the conversation about healthcare and thought leadership specifically, tell us about your background, how you got into healthcare, and more specifically, how you got into marketing and PR. Well, getting into healthcare was a pretty random thing. Marketing and PR, I did with some intention. I was an English major in college, and I was working in different industries, not really taking advantage of my writing and thinking skills that I had put together in college. And I decided to go back to school and get a degree, but I had no idea what I wanted it in. So I went to Emerson here in Boston, which has a lot of great communications programs, and I figured something here will will work for me. And sure enough, that first semester of graduate school, I took a class in public relations from this grizzled old <laughs> AP Stringer news hound guy who was just awesome. And he was a practicing PR professional in town. He taught us the real PR world. And I loved it. This this is perfect for me. I thought you can you can write, you can speak, you can think. It involves business and strategy and interpersonal relationships, all the things I like to do. So I uh, immediately gravitated toward that field and started working in some of the big uh, tech firms here in Boston, um, some of which are still around today. Weber Shandwick is still around today, and that's, that's a oh, sure. descendant of the, the company I worked at, uh, which was called Miller Communications at the time. And I learned a ton about you know how to do PR for big tech companies. And you know I wound up in healthcare kind of randomly. I, I had started out in the big agency world. I had done some... Um, uh, corporate um, work as well through the dot-com uh, boom and bust. And I randomly got a call from this company in Boston that was looking for someone to do um, PR in their agency. They had a kind of multi-purpose agency. Their PR business was growing and they wanted someone to come help um, lead the group. And I thought, well, why not? I wasn't even really looking for a job, but I thought healthcare is a booming industry in this in this Boston area. I should check it out. And it just really appealed to me. I took the job and I have really not looked back in 16 years. It's been a lot of fun. It's an industry that has so much to offer, so much great intellectual detail to dig into, you know, healthcare, clinical, business policy, technology. It's just endlessly interesting and it just satisfies my curiosity every day. Yeah. So healthcare and thought leadership. Let's 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 just get right into what we're spending time on today, which is this idea of thought leadership. It's 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 what we do as a media company, obviously with our network sites and our radio shows and our programming. We're we're pushing thought leadership twenty four seven ad nauseum, it's my, it's my say, I don't really know, but uh, 
<laughs> and you and I talked about it in the sense that thought leadership, you know, what does that actually mean? Because it doesn't mean the same thing to everyone. I know what it means to 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 me and to Health Canada Radio and Answers Media Network. But let's start with what thought leadership means to you as as a president of Aria Marketing and and your background in in PR and communications. Yeah, I'll be interested to hear if it means something different to you because I I think it's one of those terms. It's a very hot term right now. Yeah. We've been using it for a long time, but it's very it's very um, in vogue right now and everybody's talking about it and I think it's a it's a natural complement to the whole content marketing um, trend that's been uh, dominant in in marketing in many fields including healthcare for some years now and it sounds cool too you know thought leadership I think just has a nice ring to it so people like it and use it but I think it's much abused um, to me thought leadership is it's pretty simple. It's about building leadership in a market based on ideas. Many companies will build leadership in a market based on market share or sales momentum or revenue mm-hmm. or best technology or lowest price. Um, there's lots of ways you could lead in a market. But thought leadership is a particularly uh, effective way to build leadership in an industry, especially one like healthcare, which I think is really a battle of ideas and it's a market where unlike others where maybe price or speeds and feeds or um, other technical issues might be more convincing to the, to the market. Healthcare is a, is a market where ideas really still win. And, and so it's a, it's a, it's a great marketing technique for smaller companies to punch above their weight, to lead even if they don't have the same market share in sales that their bigger competitors do, but if they have the right ideas, if they have the ideas that work for their target markets, they can still win and they can still uh, get attention that's, uh, that outpaces much bigger companies. So I think that's the allure of it and the, the value of it. And even for bigger companies, you know, when they're in the position of having to fend off these disruptors and upstarts, they need it too. They need to fight fire with fire and be, and be thought leaders as well as market leaders because, you know, giants are really meant to be toppled if they don't defend themselves. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you sort of this dif- this differentiation between a, a market leader and a thought leader, you know, and I agree with you. I think that to me, a thought leader is someone at that company or organization who understands the real impact of the issues that we're facing in healthcare and eloquently speak to the impact of cybersecurity or value-based care or the, you know, the federal initiatives that are going on or legislation or, you know, challenges related to hospitals. That's to me what I think of as a thought leader. I agree. I agree. And maybe it's the difference between thought leadership as a marketing technique and, yeah. and being a thought leader as what makes a good a good um, spokesperson for a thought leadership program. Because I agree, it has to be somebody who's credible, somebody who can speak with authority. And it doesn't necessarily have to be somebody with deep technical experience. Like I think back, right. uh, we, were, right. we were with Athena for a long time, and Jonathan Bush was a great thought leader. Yes. So was Todd Park. Todd Park knew Mm -hmm. all the technical details and Jonathan Bush was much more about the vision. Both of them were great thought leaders, but, you know, uh, with depth in in different aspects of the business. I completely agree with, within that. So, so now that we've sort of defined what we respectively think thought leadership is, and and I think we're obviously very aligned on that. Why do these companies need it? You already alluded to this as far as if you're a smaller company, certainly having a thought leadership position or platform or messaging out there can can elevate you up from a, a competition standpoint, which is a great, really great point. For these larger companies, though, the well-known companies out there, brand brand awareness is at 100%. They still need thought leaders, though, too. But, but address the why on that, why it's so important to keep honing that thought leadership from, for any company of any size? I mean, I wouldn't say every company. I mean, maybe if you're, I don't know, 
Xerox and you sell copy machines and you just sell copy machines that are cheaper, faster, stronger, don't need expensive refills. Um, you know, you might do some mild thought leadership around total cost of ownership or something like that, but it's really not a thought leadership game for you as much as it is a brand awareness and, and brand building campaign. But if you're all scripts or some big, you know, healthcare technology company, right. you need thought leadership because because you have to defend yourself against competitors, big and small, and they're going to come at you not just with ad campaigns and uh, and you know sale prices and uh, marketing initiatives like that. They're going to also come at you with ideas and you know the hospitals, the doctors, the CIOs, CMIOs out there. They they like ideas and they believe in ideas and they want to buy not just what's going to work today but what's going to work for them in the future. So I think it's, you know, it's critical to maintaining leadership if you're a, if you're a leader in in any market, uh, especially healthcare, to have strong thought leadership and to to stay ahead of the competition because they'll always be nipping at your heels. I totally agree with you. I, I think thought leadership per se in in a in the retail landscape or other verticals is really perhaps different, and that might be a bias on my point, different than. Than in healthcare, and specifically in healthcare IT, where you know thought leadership to me is front and center as an initiative for building your company's brand. Yeah, and I probably shouldn't pick on Xerox. They're a great company. And they have, <laughs> they are, I'm sure they have they great are, thought leadership. They are a great company, right? Right. But I, but. I understand. I understand. <laughs> I understand the subtlety. Maybe it's not even that subtle. I, I do under. I, I do understand what you're saying. And, and again, perhaps that is because you and I are very health IT centric. Anything that's highly commoditized, I think, is yeah. usually doesn't need a lot of thought leadership. And uh, but something that's more more specialized and more you know, uh, in markets, especially that are a little less mature. Um, like I think most of the technology markets in healthcare really are still fairly immature. Maybe EHR is an exception, but, mm. um, but a lot of the, you know, these new technologies coming along and even EHR in a lot of ways, there's still a lot of shaking out going on in these markets about what exactly makes a good product and what features does it need to have and what should it cost and how hard should it be to implement, you know, the, these products have very different um, uh, genesises. They've come from all different, you know, uh, backgrounds to to become what they are today, and they have different strengths and weaknesses and very different capabilities. So, in that way, it's a very immature market, and you have players with much, you know, much different value propositions from each other that need to make the case for, you know, why their approach is the best, and that's thought leadership. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to What's My Tagline, and my guest today is Scott Collins, the president of Area Marketing. So we've talked about what we think thought leadership is, what we think it is as it relates to the healthcare and health IT space, why it's important. Once you have it, Scott, how do you parlay it? Mm. That's a good good question, and and uh, you know you've you've kind of jumped over one of the hardest parts, which is how you get it. And once you establish those people, maybe we could talk about that a little later. But yeah, once you've got them, it's interesting because we've had clients, very successful thought leadership programs with clients that we've done a great job of making the CEO the thought leader in his segment or her segment and where they are you know, seen as, as one of the most important voices in the space, which is great. But CEOs have lots to do and getting them to speak at every conference and do every interview and write every article is not practical. So at a certain point, you need to transition from the cult of personality to the larger, uh, larger field of thought leaders in the organization. You need to transfer the, the thought leadership equity that you've built up in the one person or maybe two people. You know, sometimes you start with a, with a couple people, but ultimately you've got to start to transfer that to the organization and to a larger number of people and make the organization or at least the leadership team the thought leaders. You know, if you invest all your thought leadership equity in one person, that's a very vulnerable position to be in. Once they're gone, there goes your claim to fame. And that's that can be challenging to do, but um, we have found that it can be it can be done well if you can team up your thought leader with a second tier of thought leaders and give them very specific areas of expertise to specialize in. And you know, one could be regulatory issues, one could be 
data sharing issues, one could be uh, user in issues, one could be behavioral science, whatever, you know, whatever your buckets are that relate to your thought leadership. Um, start to build up a second tier of thought leaders and then start to take some of the opportunities you've got for the, the lead thought leader and share them with the, with the second tier. Uh, Carol's not available for this interview this week, but uh, her her partner um, Bob is really good on this stuff, and he's really our expert on user interface. You should talk to him. So you start to parlay the 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 main thought leaders' equity um, and share it with the with the second tier and and, and build them up. Um, I think I think that's a that's a critical a technique that uh, that agencies and and internal teams um, need to follow. I think another important part of it is if you do your job well in thought leadership, like I said, you're going to have this thought leader busier than they can, than they can handle. And then your problem becomes not quantity, but quality. What is the quality of the thought leadership opportunities I have for this person? And how do I sort through them all? And how do I decide, should they do the interview with modern healthcare or should they do the interview with the Wall Street Journal? And, you know, sometimes that seems like an obvious choice. Well, the Wall Street Journal, right, is the ultimate, you know, business publication. It should be that, right? I mean, not necessarily. It depends on what reaches your audience. And it also depends on what kind of long-term relationship you think you can cultivate with the outlet. The, you know, the modern healthcare relationship might be one that will, that will be critical to you um, every two or three months for, you know, for a decade. And the Wall Street Journal opportunity might be a one and done, you know, related to some right. news item that came along and then it's over. So there's a lot of, I think, strategery, as um, <laughs> Farrell once said, uh, to to factor in when you're when you're uh, looking at how best to use your thought leader. So you, we, we, let's talk about losing thought leadership. You know, can companies, once they've established thought leadership, can they lose it? You, you already mentioned one way, to, which, of course, is that you may put effort, you know, thought leadership equity into one particular person and then they leave the company. Uh, are there other ways, though, that thought leadership can be lost by a company and once lost, can it be found again? Mm. You know, it's an interesting question. I, I mean, I think it sure can. And, you know, um, uh, probably the most successful thought leader we've ever worked with is uh, Mac McMillan, the, the CEO yeah. of Synergist Tech. Mm-hmm. And Mac's amazing. And he, you know, knows all about this cybersecurity stuff and is really eloquent in talking about it and relating it to whether, you know, it's the immediate needs of hospitals or what's going on on the regulatory side or what's going on in, in, uh, in politics. He's great. And, he puts so much time into he's the hardest working man in healthcare. I mean, that guy yes. does everything that's asked of him. He flies all over the country all year long speaking and presenting and he you know, he writes his own articles and he, he does it all. And he has invested so much time and effort and investing is the right word because the the result has been great equity. And he's got huge thought leadership equity and he can, he keeps, you know, spending time on it and he keeps getting, you know, he keeps um, building his leadership position. I think there was a time when he had to do more every year to keep growing his reputation. And maybe now he can do a little bit less or be a little more selective about what he does to maintain it and, you know, continue to grow it. Um, but, you know, he, he's an example of how if you really want to keep your thought leadership strong, you got to keep working at it all the time. There is no, there is no winning. There is no end. It is a constant process. And if you step away from it, I think, you know, it, it tails off and people forget about you and new people come on the scene to, to take, that, take that mantle. And, you know, I think I'm sure we could all think of, you know, plenty of people who were um, who were well known and and big thought leaders five years ago, and now we don't talk about right. them at all or their ideas right. at all. I'm sure they could kind of come back and you know say, hey, I'm back, and now I've got a new idea, and they'd have a head start. But yeah, you lose that equity if you fail to invest in it. Yeah, it's 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 the energy it needs to start the car versus maybe the car slows down a little bit, but to stop the yeah. car completely and restart it takes a lot more a lot more effort. And yeah. that, the interesting, I think that leads me into my my next question for you, which is, I would think in today's 
content carnivore environment that we all live in with this 24 seven news cycle that, you know, it's a, it's a carnivore that needs to be fed information all the time. And a lot of that information has to be content that is thought leadership driven. Is thought leadership easier or more difficult today to build than when you originally got into the PR business? Yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, you have all such interesting questions, Carol. I feel like we're we're at sort of we've been at sort of peak thought leadership for a while, and maybe we're maybe we're starting to um, to circumscribe the opportunities a little bit. I wouldn't say it's going away, but I feel like um, the the number of opportunities and the room for thought leaders is a little tighter maybe than it used to be. And I'll I'll tell you why. Um, like I think one challenge. That, that we've all seen over the last few years is just the number of um, publications is decreasing yes. and the number of pages in the publications is decreasing. Yes. So that's just less real estate to occupy for thought leaders. Um, there's more real estate online and it's of, you know, varying degrees of quality and accessibility. So, um, you know, you can argue whether the value of thought, some of the online thought leadership opportunities is as high as, um, as you know, print thought leadership or radio thought leadership or other media. I think it's, I think it's like anything else. There's premier opportunities in the online and social world, and there are, you know, um, junk opportunities. But uh, to me, the thing that's so I think that's kind of a wash. We have less, you know, traditional media, but more non-traditional. So there's still a lot of opportunities. But the thing that's, I think, making thought leadership more challenging now, really in the last um, couple of years, especially the last 18 months, is um, there's a lot more skepticism, I think, in the market right now. Oh, sure. I, yeah. You know, the, the whole fake news uh, phenomenon and what we experience in, you know, in politics and, and, and online and social media and, and what happened to all of us on Facebook and Twitter, it right. makes us, I think, much more skeptical. And we have a much, a much uh, higher bar that we apply to ideas and we question a lot more where they're coming from and why we're hearing them and how sound are they and how, how based on fact are they and how do we know? And I, I personally see it as an opportunity. I'm working with all of my clients to really work on um, credibility, being fact-based, squeezing out opinion and spin as much as possible, which is hard for me as a PR guy, but I think that's, <laughs> I think that's what we need to do right now to really be heard. We need to have super credible voices and really, uh, really stay away from angle and spin and, uh, and bias as much as possible. Cause I think, you know, we have smart readers and listeners in healthcare and they, they can detect it, um, pretty quickly. So I think credible yeah. voices stand out and have longevity and the rest are quickly dismissed. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. That 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 is the environment that that we're in. Uh, believe it or not, we only have a couple minutes left. So I I do want to get back to your comment about uh, how you can actually build thought leadership, and just want to spend a few minutes talking about some of the practices area marketing and your team employs to build thought leadership before we wrap up. Great, I'm glad we have a chance to do that because I think I think there's a lot of different paths to thought leadership, and you know if you have a great charismatic uh, leader like Mac, or we talked about the, uh, the Athena founders. Um, if you have people like that, great. You can put them out in front of people and they have tons of interesting things to say and every sentence is a soundbite and they have lots of interesting detail. And, you know, that, that thought leadership almost makes itself. Um, I'd like to take credit, you know, for Mac's uh, rise to fame, but I can't at all. He did all the work himself and we were merely, you know, there along for the ride and, and assisting. The, um, the typical company, though, and typical CEO is not super charismatic and, and, uh, and credible and interesting necessarily in his or her own right and needs, needs help with that. Yeah. And I think that's, that's easy to do. And again, it doesn't have to be the CEO, although I think it's often what you want to do. But two things I think are good techniques. One, putting together a team of internal thought leaders that you can get together with periodically 
pick their brains, have wide-ranging conversations, uncover the stories that are going to lead the market back to what makes your organization special, different, better, and then put those stories in the in the mouth of the of the thought leader. They they've got the experience to to back it up. They just need help framing it in a way that's going to be compelling. Um, so I think that you know regular uh, thought leadership idea generation sessions is great. It also you know helps you um, go back to the well and find the stuff that's going to work. I'd also say you know sometimes it's not about charisma and great ideas. It's about data, and if you can find good data, you know half of these um, technology companies in, in healthcare IT now are cloud based. They have tons of data. If they can find the time with their informaticists to dig through it and see what that data is telling us that's interesting, that data alone is an amazingly powerful thought leadership tool. And if you just get out there and say, you know, we're seeing this trend in these conditions or these treatments or these drugs or these, you know, approaches to security or whatever it is, that is fascinating information to the world. And if you are the one that can bring it to them, you're a thought leader. So um, I think, you know, finding those charismatic thought leaders is great if you can find them. If not, find the great ideas and frame them up in a way that those thought leaders, uh, non-charismatic thought leaders can use credibly and look for data, invest in data, um, and and it will pay off um, a thousandfold. Great. That is, that is great advice on, on both, both, those, both those points that you make. Scott, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Carol, it's my pleasure. I would do this every day with you if I could. You're one of my favorite people to talk to. I'm that fellow Bostonian thing, I think. You can learn more about Scott Collins and ARIA Marketing at www.ariamarketing.com. And of course, go to Twitter and follow them on Twitter at ARIA Marketing. You can share your thoughts or comments on Twitter at hashtag what's my tagline or visit the program page on healthcarenowradio.com. Have a topic related to our show? Or do you, are you an expert who'd like to be on the show? Reach out to me on Twitter at Carol Flagg or, or email me at carol at healthcarenowradio.com. Until next time, I'm Carol Flagg, and I want to know what's your tagline. 